before we're going to talk for a few minutes about the role of the Philippines, um, allow me to take you a little bit from Israel and the Middle East towards Western Europe. And uh, just a reminder, the reason why I personally believe that the Antichrist will indeed rise from Western Europe is because the of three things. Daniel saw several visions. One of them, the last kingdom that will rule is a kingdom that is the feet of the statue which is made of iron and clay combined. And uh, the rock is going to smash those feet. Jesus is the rock, remember. And um, the second thing is, of course, Daniel saw another vision of a beast with ten horns on its head, out of which three were plucked out, and the one came in the midst of them, and he spoke pompous words, and he was blaspheming God, and that was another picture of the Antichrist. And the only place in the world where you had an area that is, was comprised of ten specific tribes, of which three do not exist anymore today, is Western Europe. And then beyond that, in Daniel 9, in the vision of the seven weeks of Daniel, uh, when the Lord spoke to Daniel. And that's another reason why I'm amazed at Bible prophecy, because the prophets honored the prophets. Unlike today, when modern prophets slander each other. That's why I always say to people, I'm not a prophet, I come from a non-profit organization. <laughs> but I tell you, Daniel, in the ninth chapter, thanked the Lord for Jeremiah's prophecy. Isn't that interesting? Daniel studied Bible prophecy. Daniel, in his time, looked into that which was promised through Jeremiah. And he said in chapter 9, in the in verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel acknowledged the prophecy of Jeremiah. He was a student of prophecy. He understood the times and the seasons. He realized the Bible says 70 years the Jews should be in Babylon. It will come to an end after 70 years. And he's getting excited. And, and then, while Daniel is so excited, Lord, I'm so excited about the end of the 70 years. God says this. In verse 22, he says, actually, in verse 21, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening's offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said... Can you imagine? Gabriel, it's the second time he appears before Daniel. And he, Gabriel appeared maybe a couple more times in the whole history. And later on it was to Mary, if you remember. So Gabriel comes before Daniel and he stands before him and he says, Oh, Daniel... I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Now, Daniel, you would think he's a prophet. He understands everything. Daniel doesn't know that God is about to reveal to him something much greater than 70 years in Babylon. And in, for that, he says, I'm about to give you skills to understand. And then he says this. He says, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. Isn't that interesting? God, is, God knows your heart. 
You don't have to speak in high, beautiful words in order to show him that you love him so much. He looks at your heart. At the very beginning of the supplication of Daniel, he already, God already released a command. Now, up there in heaven, it's not a democracy. God is the commander-in-chief. The host and the armies. And when there is a command, there is a command. And he says, a command went out... And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. He says, Daniel, look, God really loves you. I don't know why, but man, you just started praying and he already called me. And he gave me a message to give you. And he gave me not only a message, I want to give you skills to understand the message. And Daniel is like, whoa. And he says, Daniel, forget about the 70 years in Babylon. I'm going to talk to you about 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And then when he talked about what's going to happen, how Messiah has to, to, to be killed in verse 26, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. He says that the armies, he said that that very part of the world that he sent to destroy Jerusalem, the Roman Empire, that prince that eventually come later on in the 70th week, he's the one, the same one, At the end, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week in 27. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. You see, he did not differentiate the people of that prince who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD from the one who is coming... In the 70th week, at the very end, in the last seven years, the tribulation, same part, same area. So, in my first message about Europe, I actually mentioned that Europe is really ready. Europe has literally imported into its territory, unlike any other empire before, Europe imported Babylon into its own territory. And um, I also showed people that the European Parliament in Strasbourg is built like the Tower of Babel. And they admit that. They actually are proud of it. Outside of the European, um, the European um, presidency in, in um, Brussels stands a sculpture of a woman rides the beast. I think we talked about it. Yes. And what happened since the last time we did talk about it? And what are we to expect in the very near future? Let me tell you something. This church is where I delivered for the first time the message on the one world government. Do you remember that? Oh my goodness. I didn't sleep a whole week before that message. And I was like, with a suit. All the way. And you have to look at it again and see how I suffered through the message. Albert Einstein said, the minority, the ruling class at present, has the schools and the press, and usually even the church as well, under its thumb. This enables it to organize and sway the emotions of the masses and make its tool of them. Very interesting, the observation of a Jewish scientist in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. He already detected that There is a movement in the world of a very small minority that rules or try to rule the world through its biggest and most influential institutions. And I'm talking about the cartel of international bankers and industrialists that are based mostly in Western Europe and in North America. We're talking about names that you probably heard of. 
names like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and the Morgans and the Lazards and the Warburg and the Schroeders and the Schiffs. And there's even a Chinese name in that list. And I want you to know that, be, don't be surprised, these people don't hide it anymore. They testify themselves of their own role. Mr. David Rockefeller, in his own book, Memoirs, in page 405, says, Some even believe that we, the Rockefellers, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists, and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. He's not even hiding it. He's saying, I am part of a secret cabal, a small... Look, five, six days ago, the FBI leaked or we got some leaks from the FBI inner emails exchange of secret society. I mean, there was, this, there was a plot. The minute Donald Trump was elected, a plot of the secret society to bring him down because it's unacceptable. He was not supposed to win. And it's interesting because that same Rockefeller in a closed meeting in Germany, in the city of Baden, said, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practice in past centuries. He's basically telling the people, hey, we, the small group of bankers, industrialists, the elites, we need to control the world. Now, we, we could have not plot this whole thing under the spotlight in early years. But now it's impossible when media is all over and in social media. Now it's okay. We can march forward. There was a congressman in America that found out about this plan. Congressman Larry McDonald. He, wrote, he said, actually, the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one-world government combining super-capitalism and communism under the same tent all under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I'm convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly evil in intent. And so what did they do with him? They killed him. He was killed in a Korean Airlines 747 that was shot down by the Soviets. It's very interesting because, um, do you believe in the power of prayer? Yes. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? Yes. Okay. Do you believe that the prayer of the righteous avails much? The, but it's not just a prayer. It says the effective and fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Okay. Do you believe that you have the Holy Spirit in you? Okay. Do you understand that one of the names of the Holy Spirit is the restrainer? Do you know that? If it was not for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this world, all hell would have been unleashed. Okay. And trust me, once we're out of here and the Holy Spirit is out of here, it will happen. Party will go on. But I want to tell you something. The power of prayer was proved in America when, when they were sure that the eight years will continue with eight more of the same spirit of globalization and the same spirit of, of, of um, one world government, then came the prayer of millions of people around the world and suddenly the, the masses not only prayed but went to vote. And the efforts to push for globalization 
one world government and the new world order suffered a major setback with Donald Trump elected as president. And the platform, look what they did. The platform had to now move back to Europe. In Europe and specifically in Germany, it's where it all started. That's where they started plotting the movement of the enlightened ones that you call Illuminati. And this is where it started, and that's where it continued. And it's interesting that Mr. Rockefeller gave his speech in Germany regarding their continuation there. It's moving back to Europe, and it's funny how they are accusing Trump for colluding with the Russians regarding the elections. Because guess what happened once Trump won, and they realized they have to win back Europe for that purpose, Obama was sent to make sure that Macron is going to win in France. I don't see any FBI investigation about this one. But I can tell you that they, by doing that, by sending the patron of globalization, the one who was supposed to make America the place that will prepare the world government, now the effort are back to Europe. We have to somehow make that happen. We have to somehow produce a Messiah from that place. And when they described Macron when he won, take a look. The guy is walking on water. While people are drowning, he, they're asking, is this the savior of Europe? And trust me, in their mind, someone walking on water is not only Europe. It's interesting how those one world government mindset people, they intend now to make Europe the place. And look what they do. It's very interesting. First of all, in order to bring a deliverer, a messiah, we need to create a crisis. Once we create a crisis, we can offer hope and solution. When Hillary, by the way, just so you know, the New York Times itself reported that Obama jump-started the Arab Spring. Very, very interesting. Obama, by his traveling all the way to Cairo in June of 2009, and by speaking to the Arab world from the Islamic University there, told the Arabs, go out and fight for freedom and democracy and basically undermine all of the regimes around. And immediately, one after the other, they started falling. It started in Tunisia, but it went to Algeria, went all the way to Egypt, continued all the way to Yemen and other places around. And that's how, by the way, the Syrian civil war started. That war that no, more than 600,000 people died, that where uh, there alone, and I'm not talking about uh, Libya and other places, it started because of the hope for an Arab Spring. Assad was so afraid that it's going to happen in his own country that he started killing anyone who would say anything in any public meeting. And that's when the riot started. And it's interesting because look at this map that I, I prepared. Look. The globalists, can we move on? The globalists are sending a U.S. president to jumpstart the Arab Spring. But what he didn't know is what he did, he created two different things. One, the Arab Spring caused a civil war in Syria that brought Russia, Iran, and Turkey into it, which is the preparation for the war in the Middle East. And at the same time, it created a major immigration crisis in Europe, and the Europeans are looking for a deliverer and a savior. Not interesting. They don't have a clue that everything they try to do plays greatly into that which God... See, God knows the hearts of the leaders of the world before they even say something. When Moses was told by God, listen, Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. You're going to demand the release of the Israelites, and he's not going to like it. Before Moses even went to Pharaoh, Moses already knew what Pharaoh is going to say. Because God revealed that to him. So the leaders of the world 
they don't know that God knows that they are going to behave and react like this. Because he knows everything. And that's the beauty about studying Bible prophecy. You know before they know what they are going to do. And it's not because you're so sophisticated, because you read the book. We know the end also. Well, in Hebrew, the end is here, by the way. It's interesting because Hillary Clinton, while being the, being the Secretary of State in Obama's first administration, she was planning on running for president, of course, in the second term, if you remember. And one of her advisors said, you need to have some sort of a war to have your ticket into the world arena as, as if you did something right. You removed some evil. And she received complaints from the European leaders that Muammar Gaddafi is about to issue a new currency of golden dinar, which will replace the petrol dollar and will ruin all the European, especially the French investments in Libya and the region. So she thought, I'm going to save Europe, I'm going to save the world, I'm going to save the dollar, I'm going to save Wall Street, I'm going to save the bankers by convincing NATO to remove Muammar Gaddafi. And they went there and they removed him and she went to the TV studios and she was laughing and she said, we came, we saw, we killed him, he's dead. That's it. Happy. May I tell you what followed that? I tell you. Ever since 300,000 people died. And the cork that kept Africa from invading into Europe was released. Gaddafi warned the Europeans, if you are not going to collaborate with me, you're going to be flooded. And they did not care. They didn't think he's really going to do that. Well, he didn't do anything. They just killed him. And now... Every month, more than 100,000 people are flooding Europe, mostly from Africa. Everybody's telling you these are all the refugees from Syria. It's a big lie. The Syrian refugees are in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. They're stuck there in big camps. Very few of them made it beyond that point. Most of the floods that is coming into Europe now is actually Africans. And it's very, very interesting because that crisis, look at the boats. These are all Africans. And at the same time, a boat leaves Libya loaded with refugees. The people who brought them, they get money. It's it's all mafia. The Italian mafia is big into that, invested into that. Because these people pay. Every one of these people paid money to run into Europe. A lot of money. Think about it. Let's, pay, let's say $100 per person, okay? 100,000 of them every month. Can you make the calculation? Now you see why everybody actually wants them out of Libya into Europe. And at the same time that happens, a rescue boat is leaving Italy on its way. And these people are being rescued. And the rescue boat is being funded by people like George Soros who are planning on removing all the borders in Europe. And so these people are getting money from one source. These people are getting money from one source. Those are caught in between. They're being sold as slaves. There's modern slavery right now. And what happened is crisis in Europe. And Soros admits, by the way, look what he says. Soros says, involvement, he says, national borders are the obstacle. And later on, when you dig in, you you find out that Soros and MasterCard join forces to profit from the immigration. And that crisis caused Europe to not be able to confront and, 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 and almost to commit suicide. And that brings division. The division is within the countries. Germany, since the death of Hitler, never had any extreme right-wing 
a, a political party in the parliament. They were so afraid of this. This migrant crisis brought them back for the first time the Alternative für Deutschland. First time ever they won seats in the parliament. And it's not only inside the countries, it's between countries. The European state deeply divided on refugee crisis before key summit. And it's interesting, remember, the two feet are made of clay and iron. They are not mixed. They cannot be mixed. They are divided already. The illegal immigration divides the EU as the eastern parts such as Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovenia and more refuse to open their borders. And that from the dream of Daniel about Nebuchadnezzar, the, excuse me, the, 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 the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 that he interpreted, those are the two feet that are made of iron and clay and the rock is going to destroy them. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is gearing up to become a big political power and even a military one. First time since the Roman Empire, Europe will have its little Caesar and a big army. President Juncker delivers a State of the Union address on September 13, 2017, in which he said that his plans are for an EU-wide army which he is attempting to push through even without the consent from the voters. Not only that, he called to combine the European Commission and the European Council presidencies in a move that would transform the EU leadership and consolidate the authority into a single figure. The next leader will have all the authority in his hands. Ever since the fall of Rome, there was no Caesar that controlled Western Europe in, in, in such a manner. The Roman Empire is the one that destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And it's interesting because if you're asking yourself, what happened after? In 395, it was gone. But in the heights of its glory, look at the size of this empire. Quite big, isn't it? And then, of course, the empire divided. In three. 395, it divided between the Western Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Byzantine named after Byzantion, which is Istanbul today. The Western Roman Empire lasted only less than 100 years. And you can see it's mostly Germany and France, uh, excuse me, and France and Spain. You see that? And the other part is the Byzantine Empire which is from Italy to the right towards Greece, Macedonia, and Turkey, and down to the land of Israel and Egypt. Now, you remember when Hitler started, he called himself the Third Reich, Das Dritte Reich. And I was wondering, why would he call himself the Third? Where's the First? Where's the Second? And I dug deep into history, history books, and I found out, to my astonishment, that from 800 to 1806, there was that European, you can put the map, this whole part was called actually the First Reich, and it was the Holy Roman Empire. They called themselves the Holy Roman Empire. It didn't have Rome, but they kept the name. Interesting. Then, came the German Empire of 1871 to 1918. That was considered by the Germans the Second Reich. The Second. And in 1923, there was a book called Das Dritte Reich, written by a German author, Arthur Müller van der Broek, in which the ideology of which heavily influenced the Nazi party was written. And the book formulated an ideal of national empowerment which resounded throughout a Germany desperate to rebound from the Treaty of Versailles where it was humiliated at the end of World War I. And then the Nazi party won the elections in 1933 and we know that they named themselves the Third Reich which is in its height of its glory 
was about to reach all the way to Moscow in order to take over most of the territory of Western Europe. And it's interesting because many people think that Hitler died in Berlin. I don't. In fact, we found from his bunker in Berlin an interesting tunnel that goes all the way to the airport in Berlin. We have documents that the guy was on the plane, a plane that was in a hangar there, that took off and landed in Spain. From there, he got into a German U-boat, a submarine, all the way to South America. And he had been seen there at least five times in different places. They moved him from one place to another. Eventually, he died, by the way. I don't think he's alive. I'm not that freak. But I just tell you that along his journey, he, he moved from one Nazi to another Nazi and another Nazi who lived in South America at the time. And they were preparing for the Fourth Reich. Germany, believe it or not, is a country that brought into its own capital the seat of Satan. I don't know if you know that, but there's a museum in Germany called the, um, the, um, <clears throat> that's the museum, yes, but uh, 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 Pergamon Museum. It's called Pergamon Museum because that big part was taken from Pergamon, from Turkey of today, which is the church of Pergamon, Remember? That's where that church was. And if you read the book of Revelation, in that church there was some leader that was martyred. And the Bible says, right where the seat of Satan was. The altar of Zeus. And that altar of Zeus, in its entirety, was brought to Germany. As if that's where Satan is going to sit right now. I'm not surprised why they led the most uh, amazing genocide of the Jewish people. Not only that, to declare that Babylon is now in Europe, they even brought the Ishtar Gate of Babylon, as is, into Berlin, to the exact same museum. The Foreign Policy magazine reported that Germany is quietly building a European army under its command. A European army. A few months ago, Helmut Kohl, one of the fathers of unified Germany, the one that was the chancellor of Germany during the time when the walls fell in 91. He passed away, old man. And I thought they'll be, give him a great German funeral. I was surprised that they didn't bring him to Germany. They brought him to Strasbourg, France, to the Parliament of Europe, wrapped with a European flag. And that's where the world honored him. As if... Germany is actually not only over Germany, but it's actually the leader of what? All of Europe. The latest surveys in Europe shows that they don't really feel safe. How likely do you expect that a terrorist attack like the one happened in Paris, Brussels, or Berlin could happen in your country? Very likely, 48%. Excuse me, um, 37% and somewhat likely 48%. More than 85% believe that they're, they're not safe in Europe. Interesting, isn't it? The citizens of Europe feel unsafe. How serious of a problem do you believe is the illegal immigrants that are coming into your country? Very serious, 50%. Somewhat serious, 31 81% believe it's a problem. How much do you trust the following institution? One, your own government. 37, 9% says very much. Let's put it this way. 51 says not at all. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, they don't trust their governments. They don't feel safe. They believe there's a great crisis in their own area. The chaos, the despair, the hopelessness are needed in order to wait for a deliverer. And they will accept him. The moment he will surface. 
I want to tell you, they are going through a demographic suicide. No wonder why they don't mind all these people. George Weigel, a distinguished senior fellow of the Washington, D.C.'s Ethics and Public Policy, there should be policy there, uh, says, Europe is committing demographic suicide, systematically depopulating itself in what British historian Niall Ferguson has called the greatest sustained reduction in European populations since the Black Death in the 14th century. The unwillingness to create the future in the most elemental sense by creating new generations is at the root of many of Europe's problems, including its difficulties assimilating immigrants and its fiscal distress. When an entire continent, healthier, wealthier, and more secure than ever before, deliberately chooses sterility, the most basic cause for that must lie in the realm of the human spirit in a certain sorrowing about the very mystery of being. And when he came to a, the Italian delegate in the EU parliament, that delegate says, look, we know we're finished. We're trying to arrange things so that we can die comfortably in our beds. Don't you Yanks come over here and start stirring things up. Did you know that the prime ministers or presidents of Europe's largest economies and all of European members of the exclusive global club, the G7, are without children? Did you know that Merkel has no children? Theresa May has no children? Italy's prime minister has no children? France's Emmanuel Macron has no children? Add to that Luxembourg, add to that um, the uh, prime minister uh, uh, of the Dutch also, and you will find out that six of the, excuse me, of the six founding members of what has evolved into the European Union, five are now led by childless prime ministers or presidents. They don't believe in families anymore. There's also a moral decline in Europe. They don't believe in the sanctity of life. The very famous story of Charlie Gard, a little baby, who suffered from a rare disease. His case came to court in Europe, in Britain. And America offered to help with an experimental treatment. The court says no. The court left him in order to unplug him. The court ordered to unplug him. And not give him a slight chance of staying alive by flying him all the way to America. That's not enough. Look at the fashion show in London. Look at the way that model is wearing this emblem on his necklace. Nostri Satanas Luciferi Excelsi. They exalt Satan openly and publicly. And it's in the altar of an Anglican church. The British historian Arnold Toynbee said, The nations are ready to give the kingdoms of the world to any one man who will offer us a solution to our world's problems. The first president of the United Nations General Assembly, Paul Henry Spack, who also was the Prime Minister of Belgium and one of the early planners of the European Common Market, he affirmed by saying, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of the people and to lift us up out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and whether he be God or devil, we receive him. So, you create a crisis, you create a division, and now you offer hope. And the hope is they have to be younger and nicer looking. They don't have any experience. The first one is they started the experiment in 2015. Alexis Tsipras, 43-year-old prime minister of Greece. And then 2017, May, 39-year-old Emmanuel Macron. And then in October, Sebastian Kurz, 31-year-old prime minister 
of Austria. They get younger and younger and younger because they don't trust anymore the old elite of Europe. And I'm wondering, who is the next that will rule all of Europe? The Antichrist cannot be a false messiah unless he is first accepted by the Jews as messiah. So they cannot be an anti-Semitic person who hates the Jews because obviously they will not accept him. You understand he's going to deceive them. Solving the problems of Europe and giving hope to the world will not be enough. His worldwide fame and power means nothing if he is not accepted by the Jewish people. And if you wonder, can a European leader be accepted as Messiah at all? Well, look at this. I'll show you an example why it is possible. Napoleon. We found in an auction a, 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 a coin that shows him. Now, let's stay here. Napoleon, emperor and king, look at him. Napoleon, em et rui, king. A portrait of Napoleon appears on one side of the medal, surrounded by the inscription, Napoleon, king and emperor, emperor and king. Now let's flip the coin. Napoleon is portrayed in imperial dress, granting a kneeling French Jew the tablet of the Ten Commandments. Inscribed under the figures are the phrase, the Grand Sanhedrin, and the date Napoleon actually announced its convention. Ladies and gentlemen, a Jew is kneeling and receiving the Ten Commandments from a European leader. When he comes, and he will come, and very soon, the Jewish people will accept him. Because he will be the one who brings peace to a very, very troublesome area. And he will be someone who will keep Jerusalem in their hand and even allow them to build a temple and worship there. Unbelievable. We need to remember, these things happen all around us. And Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Instead of you oh, shaking about the Antichrist, what do we need to do? We need to look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is seated. He will not come to, to, to bring hope to Europe. He already came to bring hope to the world. They reject him. They want Satan. They hail Satan. They, they are proud of him. And then, Satan incarnate will come. We need to look at Jesus. Philippians 3 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that in may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to him. That's our hope. And it, so you, you have to remember that the Bible is telling us what he's going to be like and we see that the day is approaching. And as we see that, Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us hold fast the hope, the confession of our hope. Because he who promised is faithful. Amen? Amen. So, I scared you. I, <laughs> I hope I didn't. But this is, this is basically how close Europe is to the rise of the Antichrist. The Middle East is ready for Ezekiel's war. The Europe is ready to bring peace after the Ezekiel war. And we are waiting for the redemption of our body from this world. Amen? Okay. Okay, last few minutes, I would like to address Philippines' role. 
in Bible prophecy because I really believe that you, you, you need to know that. We already uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that Bible prophecy is all about what? It's about the Messiah. From, from Genesis 3.15, it's about the Messiah. And we know, we know that um, the whole idea is the seed of the woman. Remember that? The seed of the woman. Good. What happened? Somebody sneezed? Major sneeze? I missed that. <laughs> well, because I'm dealing with my own. Anyway, so, can, I, can you find Philippines in the Bible, the name Philippines? No, no, no. Why, come on, Philippians. Oh my, that is a new low. He. Philippians is Philippians, and it's somewhere else. The Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philippines, we all know that the Philippines, as Philippines, is not mentioned in the Bible in that name. And why? It's because this is a modern name. Not, not all the names in the Bible are, 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 are the modern names, of course. Where did you get your name, by the way? The Spanish king, King Philip II. Yes. In fact, it started with the fact that only the islands of Leyte and Samar originally were called Filipinas. But after then, and, and that, at that time, Philip was not yet a king, he was a prince. But later on, the name Las Islas Filipinas would be used to cover the entire group of the archipelago of, of, of more than 7,000 islands. But it started with Samar and Leyte, you say? Leyte. They were the original islands who received that name. Anyone here from Samar? Anyone here from Leyte? Wow, you're the original. Well, let me tell you that um, in the Spanish maps, before they came, I hear myself somewhere. It's the FBI? Okay. In the Spanish maps that led the explorers to the islands, the name was Ophir. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? The biblical name Ophir appears in Spanish maps describing the Philippines. Ophir. Ophir appears, by the way, both in Genesis, the name of a person, all the way in the books of the, of the uh, prophets, as a place of great source of gold. Wow. Yes. So it starts from there. Also, by the way, both in Isaiah 24 and Isaiah 42, there's a beautiful description of how the name of the Lord will be praised even in the islands. It says, um, why don't I, I just say it so to kill your curiosity? Uh, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. I, I just want to get it out of your system because you're so eager to, to hear where are you. So it says that when it, um, and, and it says in the Hebrew, at least in the Hebrew, When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of the olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. They shall lift up their voice and they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel in the coastlands, and in the Hebrew, in the islands of the sea. Some people say it could be the Philippines. Um, I can imagine that. 
I think that there's a good chance that uh, even the lost tribes of Israel ended up, at least some of them here. I believe that a lot of you might be surprised to find out you have Jewish blood if you just took DNA tests. But, but I can tell you that the reason why I believe the Philippines played a significant role in Bible prophecy is if we understand what Bible prophecy is all about, if we understand it talks about the Messiah, and he talked about the king of Israel. And he talked about coming first to Israel. And he talked about their rejection was your exception. And he talks about his return. His return to Jerusalem. His return to Israel. This all means that the Jewish people must survive. And the land of Israel must be back in their hands. And the city of Jerusalem must be restored back to their hands. That's what it means. And you may take it for granted. But up until 70 years ago, it wasn't any thing that you would think that is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we were people who were massacred by, not by religious fanatics. We were massacred by people who called themselves enlightened ones. But people of the highest education. People of the highest standards of living. People of the, of, of the European elite. We were not the burden on their economy. We were their economy. And yet, we were led to the slaughter. And it started with Germany killing and deporting and expelling in the 1934, 35, 36. Of course, in 1938... Um, Germany annexed Austria, and in 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and now Jews from Poland are expelled from their homes, and it was a chaos. And this is exactly why, um, this is exactly why um, something happened in, um, in, uh, in Paris that is related to, to the um, Roman, um, uh, to the excuse me, to the German um, behavior to the Jewish people. It happened to be that there's a young man, age 19, that um, he entered into the um, German embassy in Paris after he received a letter from his family that they were all expelled or killed. He was so angry. 19 years old, um, a Jewish teenager. He took the gun and he killed the German, the first German, uh, um, am, not ambassador, but diplomat that he saw. That sparked violence against Jews that broke out across the German Reich in Austria and in Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, overnight, 250 synagogues were burned down. 7,000 Jewish businesses were trashed and looted. Hundreds of Jews actually were killed. And then Jewish cemeteries, Jewish hospitals, schools, and homes were looted while police and fire brigades stood by. Those pogroms became known as Kristallnacht because all the shattered glasses, crystal, Nacht is night, the night of the shattered glasses. And those shattered glasses are from those store windows that littered the streets. The next day, more than 30,000 Jews were arrested in the crime of being Jews and sent to concentration camps. Jewish women were also arrested and sent to local jails. Business owned by Jews were not allowed to reopen unless they were managed by non-Jews. Curfews were placed on Jews, limiting the hours of the day that they could leave their homes. A month after Kristallnacht, not in America, not in Europe, in Manila, demonstrations against what is going on in Europe and against what is being done to the Jewish people. And when the president of the Commonwealth of the Philippines at that time, Manuel Quezon, heard about this, he asked to know, why are they doing that? He was informed of what is really going on 
with the Jewish people. Bear in mind, it's 1939. The world is still unaware of the Nazi intentions. The final solution is only in 1941. So in 1939, nobody was sensitive enough to even deal with the Jewish issue. No one. And the Philippines, under the leadership of Manuel Quezon, became a sanctuary for at least 12, maybe 1,300 Jews, rendered stateless by the Nazi racist regime. Quezon collaborated with a Jewish family that lived here, American Jews that had a cigar factory. And they managed to bring those Jewish people as workers for that factory. And say there, in fact, his own had in mind 10,000 Jews. He even gave his own land in Mindanao for that project. Unfortunately, the Japanese invasion stopped that plan. And only 1,300 Jews were saved. But Manila can be proud and the Philippines can be proud that you guys save Jewish lives when no one wanted to save them. On May 13, let me give you an example. A few months earlier, May 13, 1939, more than 900 Jews fled Germany aboard a luxury cruise liner called St. Louis. They hoped to reach Cuba and then also to travel to the U.S. Cuba said no. America said no. Canada said no. The ship had to return and more than 250 of them were killed by the Nazis. While the world was closing its gates at the face of the Jewish people who understood what is coming up against them, the Philippines was one of the very selected group of people that were honored to help save the Jewish people. And that was before Israel was even born. It was about saving the Jewish people, not saving the state of Israel at the time. Remember, in Matthew 25, Jesus is speaking of how this the nations will be divided to sheep and goats according to how they're going to treat Jesus' lease of his brothers during the tribulation. The Jewish people will be getting another dose of anti-Semitism in the, during the tribulation. And the only nations and the only people that will help them throughout that time will be called sheep and will be allowed into the kingdom. The second thing the Philippines did, it's the first and the only Asian country that voted yes for a Jewish state in the land of Israel. November 29, 1947, Resolution 181 in the, in the uh, General Assembly of the UN, Philippines eventually, originally intended to say no, eventually was convinced to say yes, and had become the only Asian country to vote yes. So not only that God used the Philippines to save the Jewish people, but also used the Philippines to support the Jewish people's return to their homeland to establish their state. And if that's not enough, came a few weeks ago, President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as capital of Israel, Immediately, I mean, the Palestinian promise that the, all hell will break loose, that the world will come to an end, but the world goes on. They only found out to their dis, displeasure that actually most of the Sunni Arab world will support them only by words, but in reality, the Saudis made it very clear to them that they don't mind that Jerusalem is not going to be their capital. The Egyptians made it clear that they don't mind that Jerusalem will not be their capital. They offer them either Ramallah or Abu Dis and other places. But they don't have the support they had hoped that they will have. And when that vote came to the UN a few weeks ago, the Philippines could have voted 
yes to reject Trump's declaration, no to accept Trump's declaration, and the Philippines chose to abstain, which means we don't mind that Trump Trump's declaration. It's okay, but we cannot say it's okay lest our citizens will be subjected to violence in many of the Arab states where they work. So in reality, the Philippines did not oppose that, but quietly said, we agree. I want to tell you something. Originally, President Duterte wanted to move the embassy immediately after President Trump said that, but all of his advisors told him, haul the horses, mister. Because you, you, you just have to understand that it will put in jeopardy too many Filipinos, OFWs, and this is not smart at this moment. So they kept it quiet. But when time came, Philippines abstained and not automatically voted with the rest of the world. And the last thing is this. I want to tell you something. It makes me so sad. There's a lot of Christians around the world that love Israel. And it's nice. It's admirable. But they don't believe in sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. They don't do that. Some of them are big pastors in America. They don't even believe the Jews need Jesus. They believe in dual covenant. There is a covenant for the Jewish people and the covenant for the rest of the world. And the Jews don't need Jesus in order to be God's people and save and have life eternal. And I, I, I don't want to give you the names because it will be gossip. But privately I love to gossip. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm not going to say it. I, I, I will tell you only one thing. If you gather all the 30,000 Filipinas and Filipinos that are working now in Israel, you will get the largest church in Israel. There are more believers, Filipinas and Filipinos, than Jews in Israel. And I happen to, I was invited to speak at least in two places, in Tel Aviv. When Filipinas and Filipinos are away from their home, they are closer to God. I can tell you one thing. I see them there. Their faith is unshakable. Why? Because He is the one they can hold on to when they have no one around them. They have no family. They have no friends. And they hold on to one another and to the Lord. You see that. And that speaks volumes to the Israelis that hire them, that they're that give them that job. And once I was there, I saw that in those two cases where I spoke, I actually spoke to Israelis. Those Filipinas and Filipinos invited their Israeli bosses. <laughs> Guys, everywhere I traveled in Europe, the most lively church was Filipino church. Everywhere. There's Filipinos everywhere. You sneeze and a Filipino comes. And says, <laughs> everywhere around the world. It's amazing. And there's something about them being away that brings them closer to God. And I want to tell you something. I don't believe that there is active foreign nation that is sharing the gospel that is bigger than the Philippines in Israel. So not only that you supported them when they were persecuted, and not only that you support their right over their land, and not only that you didn't care that somebody said it's the capital, but you also understand that apart from Christ you can do nothing, and they need to know their Messiah. So if you're asking me, what is the role of the Philippines in Bible? I, I tell you one thing. I believe that God has a special hand upon this nation. Destine you to bring the revelation 
Because Jesus was the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. Remember that. You are destined to be there for the people of Israel, not only in the physical, but also in the spiritual realm. And I want to encourage you. There is, that's a great mantle. But at the same time, it will mean nothing if it's a mantle over a nation that its individuals don't follow the Lord. You understand that? I believe with all of my heart. Look, 20 years ago I came here for the first time. I don't know why. First ever nation I traveled outside of my country to teach the Word of God was the Philippines. And I came here, I was five, 20 years ago. Anyway. Come on. Come on. At least t- say I was 10. Uh, you're laughing at my face right now. It's like, huh? guys, 20 years ago, two days after I landed, I almost got killed. I was flown with a plane to a hospital in Manila. I was on a wheelchair. I thought I, di- I, thought I died. But from that day, I knew God has this country in my heart. And I have special, I come here every year. And I can tell you that God has a special plan for this nation. And your job, if you are true believers, is to prepare your nation for the return of Christ. Because when the tribulation will come, there is no more Philippines. The islands are gone. Do you understand That you have a great responsibility, not only to walk in the ways of God, but to lead your nation to Christ. Under the mantle of the authority given to you, and the privilege that was given to you, to be a significant player in the plan of God to restore Israel, the people, to the land, with their city, To the return of Christ. What a privilege. What a responsibility. And what a calling you have. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing nation. A nation that every time I leave this place, I leave a a small part of my heart here. Father, I pray that you will, you who began the good work in this place, You who chose this nation of all the other nations to play such a significant role in the restoration of your people, Israel. You who began that amazing work. We pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the diligence and the faithfulness of the members of this church and other churches, you will also complete that great work in leading this beautiful, wonderful nation to you and declaring that the Philippines belongs to Jesus. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you here in this city, in this country, freely. We thank you for a president that can boldly declare a whole month The first month of the year is the month of the Bible. Where there is no other nation on planet earth that ever declared it. Father, you have your hand over this place. You have raised leaders to do such things. You have raised leaders in the past to save the Jewish people. You are now going to raise people to restore this nation back to you. And we are looking forward to that which you are about to do with great expectations, because we know that He who promised is also faithful. We thank you and we bless you from Manila. And we say that we love you. And we ask all of this in the matchless and the most beautiful name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of God, the Lamb of God, the the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. 
And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.